<laughs> wow. Hey, Sam, this is Redford in Dallas. Thank you for taking my call. Redford in Dallas. Uh, what's on your mind? Well, so I've, I've been debating calling in for, for at least a couple months to talk about the looming commercial real estate crash. And then on Wednesday, as luck, well, luck would have it, you took a call from uh, somebody talking about the same thing. Um, I'm, I'm a financial analyst and a pension fund advisor by trade. I've been in the industry for about a decade. And, you know, I wouldn't call myself an expert in real estate, but, but it is one of the industries that I cover as part of my job. And uh, I've, I feel like Chicken Little because uh, I've, been, I've been talking about this, you know, within my circles for, for about two years. Um, and so if you'll indulge me, I, I, I'd love to talk about it. Yeah, I'd love to hear about it. I may even have you send an email because I may have follow up questions. Uh, but, yeah, because yeah, sure. this is something that like it got a little bit of tension right around like I want to say like in April and May of 2020 as uh, you know, COVID started to hit. And there was talk, I remember, about all of these sort of like loans that were going to come due eventually, and this was going to undercut the real estate market. Is it, is it, are we still talking basically the same thing? Yeah. So interest rates have obviously not helped that situation. Right. And, and, you know, you're starting to see a handful of bank force sales uh, come on the market. Uh, but, but, you know, my main point in all of this has been uh, that there is a, a sub, substantial amount of permanently lost demand um, that, that has hit the office uh, office market in the form of, uh, you know, the expansion of work from home uh, from, from you know, the majority of employers in this country. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if you walk through the math of it, um, you know, in the in the aftermath of the GFC and like 08 and 09, employers, once they got back up and running, really spent a lot of time focusing on attracting people into the office. So, you know, uh, like I said, I'm a pension advisor. Um, I, I, the largest source of cash for real estate investments in the country is sovereign wealth funds. So, you know, foreign money, generally public money, uh, and then pension money is, is uh, number two right behind it. And so, um, you know, money flooded into the office market. They were building these super insane, you know, open office concepts. Um, you know, you would read stories back then about like how Facebook had a, a two story cafeteria in one of their offices in Seattle or whatever. Um, and so, you know, talk about overinvestment through the teens. And then you have uh, the, the, you know, the worst case scenario of a global pandemic forcing people to work from home and thus accelerating what I see as the inevitable uh, move away from in office to, uh, you know, work from home. So, and, and so what, it, where now, so that, so we have all of these, um, we have all this investment. Are there, how has this been securitized? So that, thankfully I don't cover the CMBS markets. Okay. Um, so, so I, I don't speak to that specifically. I, I, I am talking about equity investment in real estate, meaning, you know, we receive cash from X source and, and plug it into a real estate investment. Um, so, you know, the way that loan structures work on big real estate investments is that there's, call it a, uh, you know, five-year floating rate debt. And for the majority of the last 25 years, that hasn't really mattered because interest rates have been basically zero. So at, at the same time as you had all this big investment and run up uh, to COVID, um, you're also getting insanely cheap money to go build these big, stupid offices. But those loans are floating. And so they're now much more exactly. expensive. Right. And right. so, and so and why? They have to refinance. Okay. They have to refinance. And so now that they're, they're refinancing at these high, significantly higher rates. They have to refinance because the loan they got initially was five years max. Yeah. And it's coming. Well, it's a it, you know, not to get too technical on it, but if, if it's a five year floating rate uh, or five year floater, um, you'll have five years locked in at a specific rate. And then um, after that five year period's over, it immediately uh, jumps up to whatever the current, uh, you know, rate is. Usually, you know, it's, it's some, uh, 
uh, it's a spread over LIBOR or it's a spread over some other right, right. Uh, m- market indicator. Uh, it's so like now, a f- you know, functionally equivalent to like an adjustable rate mortgage, right? Like you get exactly. a certain That's period. That's the same of t- way to think about okay. it. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's, it's much shorter time periods because right. these, invest- these investments generally get sold uh, every five to 10 years. But I would imagine now... That's not happening because everybody knows that this is that the market has sort of bottomed out and or I should say so, maybe not bottomed out, but is bottoming and nobody knows where the where the end is. Right. And so now you get into uh, what I see as the major problem here, um, you know, transaction flow of, of office specifically uh, is that, you know, historical lows, um, a big portion of how these big real estate investments are valued is um, called a comparable, comparable sales analysis, where you're looking at transactions of these big offices, looking at the metrics uh, and the pricing of those assets. And then once you have that information, uh, you sort of mark your books based on where those numbers are. So as of right now, very few owners in the market are writing down office to the extent that I believe they should be writing it down um, <laughs> because they're trying to re- retain value. And this is something that you'd like to, you, I know you like talking about the credit agencies um, in, in the GFC. It's a very similar trend from my perspective where nobody <laughs> wants to uh, eat shit on this. Nobody wants to like um, recognize that office Uh, Office use has functionally changed, uh, in my opinion, permanently. Um, And uh, so as a result of that, you have, you know, I don't want to say fraudulent, but you have um, uh, unrealistically valued assets being held (laughs) on these books at these big investment companies. And I'm talking about, you know, BlackRock, uh, J.P. Morgan, you know the names. Um, and they're holding them at much higher values than what they would sell for on the market today. Okay. So, All right. So let me just let yeah. me just make sure that I follow you up to here and, and sure. catch other people up. Or uh, and, and I should just say when you see J, GFC, so people know the Great Financial Crisis of two thousand eight. Um, Correct. But so basically, it's like this: like I bought a um, I, I bought a, a phone. Uh, an expensive iPhone, and it's worth uh, eight hundred dollars when I buy it. And um, but th- th- this is a great phone, and it's it's the big thing about it. It doesn't lose its value, <laughs> but um, actually, this phone the battery's not working, um, and uh, I get bad reception. And but I'm pretending it's still worth eight hundred dollars because I want to be a guy who carries around an eight hundred dollar phone, um, and. Uh, I could get a tax benefit if I said, you know what, this phone sucks. I got to return it, uh, and but I don't want to do that because I want to make it look like I'm carrying around an $800 phone. Um, in this instance, it's really just about the value on the books, but the clock is ticking, right? Because I only I have a I have debt on this that I pay that's going to jump through the roof. And my cash flow calculations were all based upon, I'm going to be able to get out of this before that happens. Right. Or that, you know, office space is going to be so valuable. I guess the phone wasn't a great analogy, but, uh, but uh, that's yeah. the deal. I mean, it's, yeah, it's basically the same thing. I mean, the, 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 the main thing to point out here is that office has been seen, you know, as long as I've been in the industry for as long as, you know, I've been reading about it, has always been seen as like the most sure thing that you're most likely to get a return on your investment because, you know, everybody loves their office. Everybody wants to pay that money. Uh, you know, rents are through the roof. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that's part of the hubris here. Uh, is that from my perspective, there was a flood to capital to um, an asset that even, you know, back in 2015, I was saying, you know, this is it, it, this is a short lived period that we're in because of the fact that I, you know, I'm a millennial. I and my generation prefer working from home. And that's just the reality of the situation. And so it doesn't take some complex uh, rubric to come to the conclusion that offices days, as it were, as, as they were in the in the teens, uh, were numbered. Um, and and, you know, 
So what happens? You know, I, uh, BlackRock, yeah, right, uh, JP right. Morgan, all of these right. investment uh, places, they have a lot of investment in these office buildings. It's one thing to carry this debt load at, you know, X, but it, it's another thing to ca carry this debt load at 5X or 6X. Right. So right. what happens, and, and we know it, we, like, do we know, is there a date? Like, there was a couple of dates in the financial crisis where it's like... Yeah, I remember in that. In Q3, yeah. I can't remember the specifics, but Q3, a bunch of these adjustable rate mortgages are going to pop up. Like, is is there a date like that, or is it going to just start becoming like a rolling phenomena? And will, like, what, what constitutes a soft landing, or is there a potential right. for a soft landing right. of that? So I think the, to answer the, the second part of your question first, the, the soft landing is is going to be governmental intervention. It's going to be some bailout in the form of, um, you know, be it uh, massive tax breaks for owning office buildings or some incentivization to convert office buildings to multifamily. I mean, there's there are a lot of different avenues that that we could go down. I I I don't think that we get there without government intervention. Um, so then the first part of the question, um, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the savings and loan crisis of the, the late 80s, yeah. that, that it specifically hit Texas. So, you know, um, going up through business school and everything, you get it beaten over your head um, as sort of like a historical lesson and what can be gleaned from it. The um, Back then, banks took ownership of, uh, you know, massive real estate holdings and went through what were called workouts, which is essentially you get in with your uh, the people who lease your building. Um, you get in with with you know even previous owners if if they're amenable to the structure, and you work out a new payment that you know you can get the bank can get the maximum um, money on their loan. And, you know, uh, the other party in the transaction has the ability to just survive. Um, it's basically like a, a like a bankruptcy negotiation. Uh, in, yeah, in, I mean, it's, in, it's comparable to that. Yeah. yeah. And it, you had a bunch of funky shit happen in the, in the 80s where, like, uh, the, there was one really wealthy uh, oil and gas guy who, who listed his... Uh, the office building that he owned uh, as his primary residence um, so that he, the tax man couldn't come take it from him um, using uh, Texas's homestead laws to kind of protect him. So I think there will be some portion of funky shit that happens uh, there, but uh, as a result of, you know, both the SNL crisis of the eighties and then, you know, what happened in 08, 09 banks hate owning real estate assets. They don't want to own um, a distressed asset because they're not in the bill. They're not in the business of managing those assets. Right. They don't um, know how to sell it. They don't know how to fix it. They don't want to upkeep it. That's when the grass on the lawn starts growing and uh, right. water damage on the roof. And they just they. Yeah. And so do you think there's going to be some type of fire sale or do you think it's so just going to be? We're I was expecting it, you know, to start happening at the turn of the year. Um, we have started to see a handful of, of like I said, um, um, distressed sales and bank force sales, um, mostly happening in, in more distressed markets like Portland, Seattle, um, you know, Phoenix. Um, but uh, I, I, I really don't know at this point. I think that Everybody's sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. I think that the owners recognize that there is going to be a precipitating event that causes real estate to be written down anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of what it was at its peak. Um, and, you know, it's been a while since I did the math on this, but, you know, we're talking about trillions of dollars lost. This is the single greatest devaluation event in history if real estate were marked to what it was truly worth on the market today. Okay. And uh, two other questions. One, the, sure. the, the class of these assets, we're talking about big yeah. Yeah. office buildings. We're not talking about somebody who bought like a four story building, uh, you know, on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn and like uh, they have a retail place on the bottom or anything like that. Right. And we're talking about right. so, big office I mean, buildings. If you th if you think about it, um, you know, on the cash flow statement for most of these companies, the biggest expense after payroll is real estate. So they're paying their leases and they fucking hate it. 
Right. They don't, nobody who owns a small business wants to be paying for their real estate. They see it as a, you know, a necessary evil, so to speak. So, um, you know, the, 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 the people, um, just to translate that to your question, you know, big, fancy buildings with, um, you know, multi-floor leases to uh, national and international tenants, you know, when those, start, when those tenants uh, see the writing on the wall, they will downsize. They'll say, we need 60% of the space that we previously needed. There's no reason for us to be paying this much. You know, let's reduce our footprint. Let's encourage a little bit of work from home. Um, and, you know, let's move on to the next. Um, you know, smaller buildings, let's say suburban office buildings, actually saw a run up during COVID because when you have some executive who hates being around his wife and kids who wants to go work um, in, in an office building, he's going to find one that's close to his house. Um, and generally speaking, that's going to be like a three or four story building, you know, smaller floor plates, uh, more available spaces for them. Um, and so I, I don't see those as potentially uh, exposed also because those are generally owned by, uh, you know, a different type of investor that's, okay. you know, more high net worth or family office investments as All opposed right. to, you know, pension fund. One other question. Uh, sure. What's the systemic danger? Is that a function of like what, how these loans have been uh, securitized? Like, okay, I, I there, there may, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of like these uh, big financial institutions are going to bet. They're going to have is is the fine is the systemic danger going to be that they're so over leveraged that um, I don't know their commercial interests will be um, you know possibly uh, endangered like where is the systemic uh, as a part I think I think that the fact that you're talking about pension money. Um, you know, I, again, I'm thinking of this from the equity side. I don't, I don't think about it as much from um, the debt side. Meaning, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the the investor whose money is tied up in the building. Um, I think that, you know, once we see losses, uh, to the extent that I expect to see losses, um, this will bleed into most, if not all. Uh, you know, call it white collar industry. Um, but I don't, I, to be fair, I don't, I don't know the extent of it. I don't know what. Um, so I would be worried. I mean, personally, if I had like a, one of those REITs, right? Uh, is yeah, that it? Yeah. Okay. And REIT is a, what, what is it? A real estate? Uh, what is the I Real estate investment trust. It's a publicly traded or privately traded um, tax benefited uh, real estate investment vehicle. But essentially it allows, um, allows you to uh, buy and own real estate, uh, traded publicly, um, and there are tax benefits so long as you're, uh, you know, not taking profits is essentially what it is, that you're distributing your profits to your investors. So uh, if folks if, if have, have any type of major investments, and obviously, you know, yeah, I can't control like where my union pension is investing. Hopefully, exactly. you know, my union pension guy is listening and goes like, oh, we can maybe start to slowly uh, pull some right. more money out. Like right. that would be the thing to do to protect yourself from this. If if what you're saying actually comes to pass. Yeah. Yes and no. But, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that I, I find hard explaining to people is that money needs a home um, and, and, you know, money is put to work in these investments in the sense that um, when, when these uh, investors are looking where to place their capital, they're thinking of a, a return that's benchmarked against some other, uh, you know, standard, call it the market, call it whatever you want. But, you know, if my investment in um, some office building is, is meant to generate me 9% and I pull that money out, and then have to put it somewhere else, um, that 9% will likely go, you know, in, in, in the current environment, it's a little more, um, it's a little more uh, attractive at, at whatever the five or 6% that they could get um, in just a standard market investment. But um, it, there is still going to be a loss and there is still going to be a reluctance on the part of the people whose money is invested to take it out of that investment. So right. nobody wants to do anything here. You know, there's 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 going to be a precipitating event. 
nobody really knows what it is. Um, and then again, nobody really knows the outcome um, because it's almost like, you know, the reason why Tesla stock price is so high is because people are invested and they don't want to pull their money out. Um, sunk money and, fallacy, right? Yeah, it's the sunk cost fallacy. I mean, it's, it's a cost. form of that, sure. Well, um, I appreciate your your updating us. Send us uh, send us an email too, and uh, sure. uh, you know, give yeah. us uh, more information if you can. Uh, it's very helpful because cool. I've been curious about that and I haven't really yeah. seen much written about it. But if you have anything yeah. that you've seen out there that's been written, uh, let us know. Appreciate yeah. the call. I'll, I'll be on the lookout. Thanks. Thanks. Sam. I know we went way over on that call. I think people should be allowed to live in uh, this corporate tower. Well, I'll tell you, honestly, like, it seems to me, great opportunity. Let's see, we got uh, one type of real estate that is uh, massively uh, going under and one that is way too overpriced. Hmm. I'll live in, you know, I don't know what uh, what company has a... I mean, Price some of these coopers. buildings, you convert them into into housing. Be pretty cool. And I don't, you know, what you could also do. One floor you keep as you know half a floor office space every three floors, and then you have like little, uh, you know, some people can go to their little work at yeah. whatever it is. But the banks that own all the commercial real estate wouldn't be able to withhold housing from people and make them work harder. Then, so I don't think we'll probably do hmm. that. I wonder if we. We'll get a discount on our office. Unlikely. <laughs>